Hello everyone, bring you a video today looking at some of the components of Canada's combat uniform introduced in the 1960s. What we'll be looking at in this video is the combat coat GS. This is actually the slightly modified pattern, it's not the initial pattern that was introduced, it's the, the next one along, but the change did occur in the 1960s. This is a 60s dated example. We'll also be looking at the GS trousers which go along with this. Uh, they were also modified as well, but these are uh, the trousers we'll be looking at are made to the initial pattern. It's an area of my collection I'd like to expand in the future, looking at the, the different elements of this combat uniform. Being in the UK, it's a little bit difficult to sort of search some of these items out. So it's nice to have a, an example of the GS jacket, or GS coat in the Canadian terminology, and the GS trousers from the 1960s, both with 1960s dates. There is, of course, also the shirt coat, which is essentially a lightweight combat jacket and lightweight trousers to go with it and other components of the combat uniform. What we're looking at today is primarily obviously the two GS items of this, both dated from the 1960s. Canada's combat uniform is quite interesting. It was in service for a long time with incremental changes. This would still be recognisable to troops serving in the 1980s through into the 1990s and then through to the introduction of CADPAT. It did change, but not greatly there were detail changes in the, the buttons used and so forth. The initial pattern had had a stand collar, it didn't have this fall down collar here, but other than that again the design is very similar to that first introduced for the GS coat. So we'll talk about this in more detail, we'll then of course talk about the trousers as well, we'll, we'll look at the interiors of both, look at the construction and so forth and hopefully it'll be of interest. So the combat coat uh, initially, uh, this looks quite strange. It's very narrow breast pockets. The reason for this, of course, is this is introduced alongside the 1964 pattern web equipment, which we've looked at previously, or slightly before. Combat uniform did uh, arrive a little bit before 1964 pattern, and certainly was issued in on a large scale more rapidly. 1951 pattern web equipment would be around for quite a while still. And 1964 pattern took a longer time to ro roll out and, and replace it. The combat uniform was issued out quite quite rapidly and replaced the preceding uniforms uh, in combat conditions, in training and in on exercise uh, quite rapidly. The reason for these odd pockets is the 1964 pattern web equipment, of course, doesn't have ammunition pouches. And the initial intention had been that the the combat coat as we have it here and the shirt coat would serve as beasts of burden for ammunition. So these are designed to take a magazine for the C1 rifle, which is essentially the 20 round foul magazine in, in dimensions. These pockets here will take one magazine each. There are also loops in the lower pockets and these will take a magazine each as well. So in the combat coat we have here, you have loops in each of these pockets for a total of 80 rounds there, 100, 120 if you were carrying the full complement of magazines in the coat. This wasn't very popular and as a result the 1951 pattern ammunition pouches would commonly be used in modified sets of 1964 pattern to carry ammunition on the belt. Just the design wasn't very popular from that point of view. It doesn't work very well as a concept but this style of pocket would endure through even though they were not by the latter days they were not being used to carry ammunition Canada would pers persist with having these small angled chest pockets designed to carry magazines. In terms of construction, we have a reinforced piece over the shoulders here, obviously a button front, and you, underneath this you do have a zip as well. The buttons are interesting, uh, which is a slightly odd statement to make perhaps, but these were quite influential. Uh, they were, they'd been used previously on Canada's cold weather uniform, parkers and so forth, going back as far as the Korean War. And of course, they are really derived from Canada's battle dress buttons, the small metal buttons used on Canadian battle dress, which had a pin through the middle, which you stitched around rather than having four holes. These are similar. They have a plastic pin across the middle or a plastic bar with a loop of cloth through them. And behind, we'll try and get a shot of this, behind, if I unbutton this one perhaps, they do have a, a loop. So they, they, the loop is, is free and you can get your finger in behind the button, as you can see there, which means they're a little bit more a little bit easier to manipulate when wearing gloves. Very big and chunky. On the, the, sh the combat coat here, all the buttons down the front are of this larger pattern, as are the buttons on the pockets. On the, the lighter weight shirt coat, the ones down the front are smaller. And the, the large buttons on this, the 1960s combat uniform, are the only ones which have this design. The ones on the epaulettes 
and under the collar here are four hole plastic buttons and that would change later on to a smaller type that used the same system here of having a loop of fabric. These would then of course go on to be used on British Soldier 95 uniform and they've appeared on all sorts of private purchase and some issue items in other countries as well as just being a good design. So quite influential from that point of view in terms of combat clothing. Obviously you do have the two large lower pockets here as well. As already mentioned, they have loops in them for magazines as well as being large enough to carry other bits and pieces. No draw cord at the waist, which is slightly unusual for combat uniform of this time period. Uh, certainly the, the US combat uniform and British combat uniform of this time period includes a draw cord at the waist as well. But that's lacking here. We do have epaulettes. We'll look at those as we move this round. One final thing to talk about, which obviously will, will be visible as we move this round as well, is the collar. It's actually corduroy lined. And as mentioned, the, the preceding design to this, the unmodified combat coat design, had a, a shorter stand collar, didn't have this proper fall down collar, but again, that was also corduroy lined. I'd very much like to find a, a, an initial uh, pattern of one of these. It would be nice to have in the collection, but uh, something for the future perhaps, and, and a future video if I do manage to find one. If we turn the collar up here, you can see it does have a, a button flap underneath the collar there. And again, this illustrates the four hole buttons that are used in conjunction with these larger looped buttons. Another thing to mention here as well is the interesting material that this combat uniform is made from. It's actually made of a nylon mix and you can see you get this sort of pepper pot finish uh, due to the, the mixed fibres that this is made from. If we get a close-up of the fabric here, you can hopefully see that. That's the front of the smock. We'll move this round now and have a look at the details of the arms and the back and so forth. Looking at the left-hand side here, just unbutton the epaulette. You can see you do have epaulettes up on the shoulders there. And these, of course, would be used to wear rank slides be used to wear uh, insignia uh, combat subdued shoulder titles on a uh, rank slide on the shoulder as well, even if you weren't wearing any rank up there. You see the arms here, we do have a, a large reinforcement piece on the back of the elbow there, as is typical for combat uniform of this time period, combat uniform in general, you do have adjustments at the cuff there, you have two buttons, so you can button in on the tightest one or the loosest one, depending on what level of ventilation you need whether you're trying to, to keep warm and keep the, the air in underneath this. If we lift this out of the way, you can see the seam running down under the arm, all the way down the side here, under the pocket. We do have another seam coming in at the rear there, which we'll have a look and we'll turn this around and have a look at the back now. Looking at the back here, you can see it's a relatively complex construction. Uh, obviously we have that reinforcement piece over the shoulders again, which we saw at the front. Single seam down the rear there, underneath that, and then we have a another seam coming in under the shoulders here. No draw cord of the waist of course, but we do have these sections sewn in here to pull the waist in, make it a little bit smarter. That's the, the rear of the uniform. We've had a look at the, the left hand side. There's nothing really to differentiate this on the right, so we'll take a look at the interior of this now. We'll have a look at the, the, in, the internals of it. Okay, so here we have the coat turned inside out on the mannequin, and you can see various features here. We have obviously the little flap that goes underneath the, the zip there to give some uh, wind protection button on the inside of the collar there you can see again we have these strips here with button holes in to allow the, the liner to be buttoned into this there is a liner which will be covered in future videos hopefully that's set as a separate item but uh, there is the you can fit a liner to this for cold weather use similar to the US practice at the time of having a button in liner for the combat smock or combat jacket or combat coat in this instance we have an inside pocket here as you can see single inside breast pocket there and you can see the details of the construction and so forth, the, the draw cord running at the bottom there, the inside seams of the pockets and so forth, and that reinforcement piece running over the shoulders there. Looking at the arm here, you can see some neat repairs here with little patches sewn in with green thread. And you can again see the details, you can see the, the reinforcing piece sewn in at the elbow there, and the cuff detail and so forth. Looking at the rear here, we can see details of the construction again with the large instruction label down in the skirts there, which we'll have a look at in detail now. And looking up at the collar here, you can see these two tabs here, which again help to button the liner in when it's worn with this. i say that's something that will be covered in a future video. Looking at the front here again, we can see the label, which is down in the, underneath the, the weather flap at the front here. And we'll get a close up of that now. And this reads, Peerless Garments Limited, the manufacturer, coat combat GS modified, 
and the modified refers to the change of the collar. And this is dated September 1966, so the change came fairly soon after the introduction of combat uniform. And this is a size bore, which is regular small, height 67.1 inches to 71 inches, and at breast 33 to 37 inches. And we have the chap's name written in there underneath. So here we have the trousers. Now these primarily have the small four hole buttons all the way around. This one's actually been replaced with a US button in the middle here. The uh, Canadian button was missing. That's been replaced with a US uh, button off, uh, I think probably off BD uni uniform, battle dress uniform. You have belt loops at the top here, but they're narrow for obviously a, a narrow waist belt. You have these buttons here for attaching suspenders. You can see there. And then you do have two rear pockets, as you can see there. Put these out to the side. You can see you have a button flap over the pocket there. We're actually missing the button off this side. And then we have large a large leg pocket here with the looped button, as we saw on the combat coat. So the larger buttons are used down on the, the leg pockets. You can see the button flap to the side there for the side pocket. The button's not missing on this side. And again, the large leg pocket there. Move this up, you can see here we have reinforcement over the knee here, quite heavy reinforcement. And then down at the ankle, we do have a draw cord. This is quite heavily worn here. You can see actually the cord is exposed, it's worn through there. You do have a draw cord at the ankle there. Quite a heavyweight design. These would also be, you know, obviously the part of the uniform that was a lighter weight design as well. These are quite heavy weights, and as we'll see, we'll turn them inside out now and we can see that they are lined. So looking at the inside of the front here, if we turn this back, you can see we have a zip fly there. We have a very large label here giving the instructions in both English and French, of course. Try and get a close-up of that now, though it's going to be a little difficult because it's so scrunched up, but we'll I'll try and put a shot of that in here to have a look at the details so you can read them at your leisure. You can see the internal reinforcement for the knees here, and these are lined. You can see the lining loose at the bottom there. Comes down to the ankle there. Better view of the draw cords as well. These do have metal eyelets. You can see there, running around the, the ankle there to draw those in around the combat boot. The bags for the pockets here on each side, as you can see. If we turn these around, you can see the bags for the rear pockets here. You have that reinforcement piece over the seat as well. So they're very heavyweight, they're both lined and have these big reinforcement pieces sewn in as well. We have the label up in the waist here, and again we'll get a close-up of that now. And as you can see the manufacturer is Peerless Garments Limited, Trousers Man's Combat GS, these are from March 1963. Size 7, which is long, small, an inseam of 33 and a half inches and a waist of 27 to 30 inches. Do not press this garment, obviously, due to the uh, material that it's made from. So there we are, I do hope you found it interesting looking at this. Quite an eccentric combat uniform, certainly as regards carrying the magazines in the, the combat coat. I really like Canadian combat uniform. As I say, it's an area of my collection I'd like to expand. I have a little bit of 80s stuff. I have a couple of 60s shirt coats which will be covered in future videos. I'd like to, as I say, get a, a better uh, timeline of the combat coat and the trousers. All stuff for the future, perhaps. But I really like Canadian combat uniform, and that's one of the reasons I'd like to expand the collection. And obviously, hopefully, that will lead to future videos as well. If you have found this interesting and you'd like to see more from the channel, please do consider subscribing if you haven't already. And whether you're newly subscribing or you've previously subscribed, please do make sure you hit the little bell, the little notification button down below. And that will, of course, alert you when I upload future videos. If you really like my uploads and you would like to support the channel, you can. Both Patreon and PayPal are linked down below. And as ever, a huge thank you to everybody who supports the channel using those two methods. It really is greatly appreciated, as I always say. If you'd like to follow the channel on social media, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter are all linked down below. And if you'd like to get in touch but you don't really use social media, there is, of course, an email address down there as well. But that's everything for this video. So until next time, bye for now.